Today I want to explore habitable planets, but not just any habitable planet. I want to figure out what is the largest possible habitable planet. And the answer may just surprise you. Or not. It depends on how much reading you've been doing on this subject. Anyway, let's move on. Now, habitability is a really nebulous word and it can mean different things to different people. And we have to be precise in this exploration with what we mean by habitable. Because, for example, you can look at a world like Europa, the second moon of Jupiter, and it has a thick icy crust, but underneath that is a globe-spanning liquid water ocean with more liquid water than the Earth has. And that might be a potential home for life. It might just be habitable. We, we actually don't know. But for this exploration, I'm going to define habitability with four criteria. Because I want to look for worlds that are a lot like the Earth, just bigger. So to define habitability, we're going to start with an atmosphere. There has to be an atmosphere on a habitable world just like there's an atmosphere on the Earth. But it can't be too thick, otherwise it's going to choke off the potential chances for life. The second criteria we're going to have is that it must lay within the habitable zone of the parent star. So for example, the Earth is in the habitable zone of the Sun. The third criteria is that there must, must, must be liquid water on the surface of this world, just like the Earth has. And the fourth is that the world must have a magnetic field, just like the Earth does. The magnetic field is very important for protecting our atmosphere, and our atmosphere is very important for maintaining liquid water on our surface. And because of our distance from the Sun, we get just the right amount of energy to keep everything in balance. So I want to find an Earth-like planet somewhere out in the galaxy that is as big as possible. And maybe I want to go visit there. It depends. Let's find out. So let's start with our first criterion, which is that our habitable planet must have a thick, but not too thick atmosphere. Um, and when we look at our own solar system, there are basically two kinds of planets. There are the small rocky worlds, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then the large gassy worlds, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Yes, I know Uranus and Neptune are technically, technically ice giants, but let's leave that aside for the moment. And these two kinds of planets are radically different from each other. And the largest of the rocky worlds is Earth, and the smallest of the gassy worlds is is Neptune. And Neptune is 17 times more massive than the Earth. So there's this giant discrepancy, this giant difference between these two kinds of worlds. The gas giant worlds are pretty much the same and the rocky worlds are pretty much the same. And then there are these two distinct populations. But by definition in our exploration of the largest possible habitable world, we're going to be exploring the space between these two kinds of worlds. We're going to be looking at planets that are larger than the Earth. And in, in our solar system, we don't have any examples like that. We don't have a rocky world with a thick but not too thick atmosphere in our own solar system. Uh, but when we do exoplanet surveys, and we know of around five to 6,000 exoplanets, these are planets outside the solar system, it turns out that the most common kind of planet are planets that are somewhere between the mass of Earth and Neptune. It turns out that our solar system is kind of unnatural with having these two distinct populations. The most common kind of planet that we are finding has a mass somewhere between the Earth and Neptune. Now, when we look at these kinds of exoplanets, it's tough to tell where a dividing line should be between habitable and not habitable. Uh, if you look at the Earth, we have dense core, we have a rocky mantle, we have a nice atmosphere, we have liquid water on our surface. But our atmosphere isn't too thick, it, it's, just, it's just nice. And if we look at something like Neptune, the smallest of the gas planets in our solar system, 
it definitely has too thick of an atmosphere. You can plunge for thousands of miles down into the atmosphere of Neptune and the pressure ratchets up to millions of times that of sea level air pressure. I'm going to go ahead and call that inhospitable. And yeah, maybe there's some exotic form of life that lives deep in the depths of Neptune. But for now, at least for our definition, we're going to say that's not going to work out for us. So I want you to imagine a line with Earth on one end and Neptune on the other. And this line extends in both mass and size as we get bigger and bigger and we stretch out from Earth to Neptune. Obviously, a, a world that's only, say, 10% more massive than the Earth is, is probably going to have a good chance of being habitable because it probably looks a lot like the Earth. And probably a planet that is just 10% smaller than Neptune is probably going to be inhabitable because it's going to be just like Neptune, only a tiny bit smaller. But somewhere on this line is going to be the transition point from a rocky, world with a thin atmosphere to a gassy world with a thick atmosphere. And this line is actually really tough to spot. You know, is it 50% the mass of the Earth? 100% the mass of the Earth? Uh, five times the mass of the Earth? Uh, astronomers make a relatively arbitrary distinction here where they call any world that is up to 10 times the mass of the Earth, they call it a super Earth. And then any world that is from 10 times to 17 times the mass of the Earth, they call that a mini Neptune. Uh, the, again, this is just an artificial line. And as we'll see, it's not going to be very, very useful because a planet that is eight or nine times the mass of the Earth isn't guaranteed guaranteed to be a rocky planet even though it's called a super earth and the first thing you think of is a planet like the earth but larger uh, that's not always the case because what matters for habitability isn't just the mass but also the density i'm your density for example there's there's this one world a toi 27 Zero C. It orbits its star every 5.7 days, um, but that star is a red dwarf star, so that's no big deal for that orbit to be so close. This world is seven times the mass of the Earth. That, that's a pretty big world. And it has about 2.4 times the width of the Earth, so definitely also a big world. And it should be classified as a super Earth, but actually, it looks more like a mini Neptune. It's actually a gas world. It has this super, super thick extended gaseous envelope and only a tiny, relatively tiny rocky core in the center. It looks absolutely nothing like the Earth, even though it's classified as a super Earth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's 55 Cancri E, which is 41 light years away. It has eight times the mass of the Earth. It's, it's even more massive than TOI 270C. And it has about twice the radius of the Earth, and it's definitely a rocky planet. Even though this is bigger than the last one, or more massive than the last one, if you were to look at it, it would definitely, definitely look like a rocky world. It would, you would never classify it in a million years as a gassy planet. You would definitely classify it as a rocky planet. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. But this gets into our second criterion, which is the planet must be in the habitable zone of its star. The habitable zone of a star is that range where you get just enough radiation and heat from your parent star. If you're outside the habitable zone, then all your water freezes. And if you're inside the habitable zone, then all your water evaporates. But liquid water can exist in a very narrow band around every single star. And unfortunately for 55 Cancri E, even though it is a massive super Earth and it's a rocky planet and it's doing great, it has the right mass, it has the right density, it looks like a prime candidate. It's so close to its parent star that it, an entire orbit takes only 17 hours. And its temperature is so high that the entire planet is molten. So that is probably not going to be habitable. It's too close to its parent star. So we're looking for a super Earth. We're looking for a giant world that is not so giant in, in that it's super gassy, um, but also is in the habitable zone of its star. 
Third criteria is liquid water on the surface. Liquid water on the surface of a planet is really, really tricky, and it's not just a matter of being in the habitable zone of a star. For example, both Mars and Venus are in the habitable zone of the Sun. There could be liquid water on the surface if they hadn't gotten all haywire. In the case of Mars, long ago it, it cooled off and it lost its atmosphere. And in the case of Venus, it turned itself inside out and its atmosphere is way too thick. So it's not just a matter of being in the habitable zone of a star. That doesn't guarantee the existence of liquid water on the surface. Instead, you need the right combination. You need a thick, but not thick, too thick atmosphere. You need to be in the habitable zone and you need to have the right composition. When we look at these super Earth exoplanets and we start uh, trying to find that dividing line between a rocky world with a decent atmosphere versus a, a gassy a mini Neptune, a super gassy thing, it's, it's actually it's not so much about the mass. It's about the radius. And the dividing line is somewhere between one and a half and two times the radius of the Earth. If you're looking at a super Earth, if you're looking at a massive world, and it has a radius around one and a half to two times the radius of the Earth, then it's most likely going to be a gassy planet. Something like a, a it's, it's not classified as a mini Neptune, it's like a micro Neptune or, or a gas dwarf. There are all sorts of interesting names for these kinds of objects. It's not going to be a rocky world. The reason for this is that super Earths are really, really good at holding on to their atmospheres because they're so big. When planets are first forming in a protoplanetary disk and the material is accreting to form a planet, uh, there can be lots of rocks and maybe some ices that going to go into building a massive planet. If you have a nice big planet that's like five times the mass of the Earth, there's also at that time going to be a lot of gas in that protoplanetary disk. And that massive object is gonna be really good at piling up a big, thick atmosphere. And because of its strong gravity, it's gonna be really good at holding onto it for a long period of time. If you look at something like Mercury, it's just too small to hold onto an atmosphere for an extended period of time. But if you look at a super Earth, it has a lot of strong gravity, and so it can hold on to its atmosphere. So super Earths tend to have very, very thick atmospheres. The only way to thin out the atmosphere, or, or one of the only ways to thin out the atmosphere of a super Earth, is to bring that planet close to its star. And the closer you bring it to the star, the more heat it will get from the star, and then the heat will drive away that gas. It will give it enough energy that the gas can escape. It can reach the escape velocity and just float away from the planet. We call this process photo evaporation, and no, that's not a TikTok filter. It's, it's a physical process. Anyway, it's for this reason that for a long time astronomers debated if super Earths could ever be habitable because they're either far away from their star and they have these super thick atmospheres, or you bring them close to their star and the atmosphere blows away, but then you're left with an inhospitable molten lava planet, which is not going to be good for life. And so it seems very, very difficult to have a planet that strikes just the right balance. But with more surveys and with more data, there are some planets that do seem to strike that middle ground that seem to be big, but not too big, that seem to have atmospheres, uh, but not too thick of an atmosphere. But before we start talking about that potential candidate or those potential candidates, we have to talk about the last criterion, the presence of a magnetic field. The magnetic field of a planet plays a crucial role in protecting a planet's atmosphere, especially in the case of the Earth, because any star is going to be constantly emitting highly charged, fast-moving particles. And these particles can literally slam into atmospheric molecules and send those molecules flying. The solar wind can strip away an atmosphere. Now, this is what happened with Mars. It used to have a magnetic field. It used to have an atmosphere. It used to have liquid water. 
but then its core cooled down because M Mars was so small. It lost its magnetic field and the solar wind just stripped away the atmosphere. Our atmosphere owes its very existence to our protective magnetic field. And so if we want a planet to be habitable, man, it better have a nice strong magnetic field. Now, do we know of any exoplanets with magnetic fields? It's there are some indications, uh, some potential hints of evidence that some exoplanets do have magnetic fields, but really it comes down to modeling. It really comes down to uh, building computational models of how these planets are formed, what their composition might be, how it's evolved over time, whether it can support a magnetic field. There have been some simulations and some studies looking at super Earths in particular checking to see if they can support a magnetic field. It seems like they can. That's my own personal take and my personal bet is that it's perfectly possible for a super earth to have a magnetic field and probably likely. Uh, the conditions that gave rise to a magnetic field on the earth are also likely to happen on a super earth. However, some things can shut off a magnetic field. Like if you look at Venus, Venus has such a slow rotation rate that its magnetic fields sh shut off. If you take a planet and you put it too close to a star, you can get tidal locking and that will slow down its rotation rate and maybe shut off its magnetic field. So it's one of these things that we have to take on a case by case basis. And we have to do a lot of modeling. In a control tower, trying to reach outer space aliens or something. <laughs> and that brings me to the big reveal. The planet that I believe is the largest habitable world. And again, habitable is sticking to the definition I set out in the beginning of the video. I, I can't promise that there's life on this planet. I can't promise that there is even potentially life on this planet. All I know is it meets all the criteria. Uh, but I do have to clarify, we don't have a lot of data about this planet. We know its mass, we know its radius, that, that's, that's about it. From there we can calculate the density and we see that the density is compatible with the presence of liquid water. It's not too high density where we know it's definitely just blasted rock and it's the density isn't too low where we know it's just a bunch of gas floating around. It's consistent with the presence of liquid water but we don't know for sure. And this planet we've done a lot of simulations examining uh, different layers of atmosphere, different compositions of atmosphere and in many of those simulations, uh, making a bunch of assumptions, a bunch of assumptions, a bunch of guesses here. It looks like liquid water is certainly possible on the surface. It definitely hasn't been ruled out, which when it comes to exoplanet is, is a big deal. And the planet is, drum roll please, drum, drum roll please. There we go, there's the drum roll. <laughs> and the planet is, LHS 1140B. That's right, LHS 1140B. Please come on down to collect your big prize, your big prize being the potential to be a home for life. This planet is orbiting a red dwarf star about 49 light years away. We have both the mass and the radius of this world. It's about 60% wider than the Earth and 6.48 times the mass of the Earth. So we have very precise numbers for both of those. Notice that that radius is straddling that boundary right there. Like it could be too thick of an atmosphere to support life. It could be something like a gas dwarf or a micro Neptune or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it could also just be a giant rocky world with liquid water with a nice atmosphere. It only orbits uh, less than a tenth of an astronomical unit away from its star, which is super close, but that star is a red dwarf star, so it actually sits on the outer edge of the habitable zone of that star. Yes, there could be tidal locking, which would prevent rotation, uh, significant rotation, which would shut off a magnetic field, but maybe there are other planets in, the, in that system that give it little tweaks and allow it to rotate. We don't know yet. Magnetic fields are a tricky thing. 
There have been many models and simulations done of a potential greenhouse effect. Well, this is one of the advantages that super Earths have is that you can put it on the outer edge of a habitable zone and they tend to have thicker atmospheres because they're so big. And then that this gives you a boost in the greenhouse effect so it can actually keep you warmer. And liquid water is perfectly possible on this world and, and there might be life on this world that is six and a half times the mass of the Earth, the largest habitable world that we know of. LHS1140B, let's give it a big hand and thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you liked what you saw, please like, share, and subscribe, do all the usual YouTube things, and please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to help support the show and I'll see you next time.